Welcome to the Mobile Application Framework YouTube channel. My name is Frank Infus and I'm from the Oracle Application Development Tools and Mobility Tools Product Management Team. In this episode, I talk about the consumption of REST services with an XML payload in MAF. Now, let's have a look before we start what we support as far as RESTful services go within MAF. First of all, and I mentioned that it's XML. So XML payloads, that is what we have a data control for, but then we also support RESTful services that use a JSON payload or a payload that even differs from JSON just by using the RESTful adapter that we provide, which is a little Java object that you wrap in a Poetry data control and then you can expose it. And I have a separate episode recorded just on that topic. So don't worry, you get all of the information because here I want to stay with the XML payload. Now, when talking about the XML payload, the call options we have, first of all, is declarative. So I can use the data control panel, just drag and drop that in. The restriction to that approach or the limitation to that approach is I must have XML and it has to be UTF-8. If there's any variation of that, if you don't have an XSD or whatever, then the programmatic approach would still apply, which is to use the REST service adapter similar to the way that we use it with JSON and get your XML payload from there. So you're covered no matter what the payload is. So let's continue with the declarative approach. Now, for the declarative approach, you create a data control similar to the SOAP data control I showed in a previous episode. If you haven't seen that, just go back on YouTube and you can get that information as well. So starting from the file menu, file new from gallery business to your web service, or if you have a view controller project, right mouse click on that it provides you the same menu structure to get to the uh, new component gallery. And there you select the web service item or the data control item for web services. And here you have a choice between SOAP and REST. First thing that you do is you switch to REST and then you give it a name. And that is the name that actually will show in the data control panel. So if you want to have a easy to understand contract between the technical side and the user side, make sure you have good naming convention here. You then click the green plus icon in that dialog because you have to create a REST connection. You have to tell us in our infrastructure where the REST resource resides. And here it's up to REST resource how many data controls you have to build. Ideally, you try to have a REST resource combining just as a single point of entry into a REST service so that you have one resource to point to However, not always it's that you're the owner of the RESTful service. Um, there are infrastructures and it, you might want to have a look into a mobile suite that will tell you how you can use uh, a service bus to aggregate information of different services and more or less harmonize your API that you expose to um, the mobile client, but that's a different topic here that I don't cover. So you give it the URL, the endpoint, you will um, then give us if there is a requirement for authentication, the authentication requirements for the endpoint so that we can access the endpoint. You have a button to test the functionality if you can access the service that will give you a success. Once you get that success, you're happy, you press OK. So then in the next steps, it's up to you. And I mentioned when I talked about RESTful services that the REST payload is encoded or the access to REST payload is encoded in URIs. And these URIs can even contain parameters. Now you have to tell the framework exactly about that. It's not yet reading straight from a battle file, which would be a document template. Uh, you actually have to kind of configure that document template information into this dialog. So you start off, for instance, with the root information, and then you see I can map specific HTTP methods to that, like get, post, put, or delete. And and then I have another one, you see the second entry on that screen where I parameterize the URL. So for instance, if I want to request um, a specific department ID, yeah, so departments will give me all departments ID, but I want to have a de specific department ID uh, that I want to query the department resource for, then I add this 
to the URI. And here you see one of the nice things about REST, which is that the URI and the composition of the URI is very dynamic. So I can have uh, data serving as URI parameters. And this is what I do in this dialog. So I more or less define all of the URI definitions as I have this on the server side, just as a pattern for this in dialog. You see hash hash name hash hash. Now that's our way of telling uh, the framework, now this is a variable, this information will be passed in at runtime. It doesn't exist yet. So the next dialog then will allow you to specify the schema, the XSD files that are used with a specific payload, either a payload that you expect to come from a server or a payload that you want to send as part of a method, like an update. You typically should have the resource as an object passed to the server and this object is encoded as a schema because it's XML based so it's a schema and for that we need to know about the XSD uh, information. Now what is it what we do with that information? It's not that we need that information to um, format the request at runtime. Um, what we need that for is to show the data structures in the data control panel. As all of the beauty in math comes from simplicity and productivity we need to know about that infrastructure to show you the right items and elements in the data controls panel so that you have it easy building your mobile application. You see also that for input uh, types that are um, simple types like you see department ID could be provided as a number like 10. You provide that and we will validate this request as well for you. So make sure that whatever you build on a client side later on matches what you find on the server side. And the last dialog allows you to test all of the URLs that you created and that you mapped to specific information with the test data and hopefully, as in this slide, you see success all over the place because that tells you that your data control is fully functional. And I should point out to this time, you can rerun that wizard. So what you can do is you can restart the whole process and just provide exactly the same name of the data control that you provided on the first time. A dialog will pop up, will tell you that there is an existing data control you could say, okay, I just want to continue, and then you can reconfigure an existing data control, maybe add additional URIs to an exposed data control infrastructure. And that is what you see. So we talked about the different elements that we have within the data control panel when I talked about data controls. If you missed that, just go back a few episodes and you will see that. Now, the REST data control starts off with a data control container. So that's the name that you provide. But then it also has constructors. I mentioned briefly constructor when I talked about data controls. A constructor is useful when you need to create new objects or when you request something that has a complex argument that it expects. Now what we do within the tool is we flatten that object. The argument that goes with a post request, if it's a department a service, will be the department object. So we have to flatten that into department ID, department name, manager ID and location ID probably. Now this is what the constructor is doing. And dragging and dropping a constructor onto a page, a mobile page, allows you to create a new object that you then can send. Or if you update, if you call a method or a resource for update, then actually you use a constructor to create the payload. The get request returns a collection. We see that here. So I get all departments as a result of the query. And you see the name here, all departments, is not really REST-like. It's something that I use as a kind of a contract, a way of communication between myself, the business service adapter, and whoever is continue building the application. So it's a kind of a translation of technology uh, to semantic uh, application domains. Yeah. So all departments, that is what they should understand, what they get. Then we have MUF operations which are exposed here. So these operate locally on the iterator in MUF. You can use that information to create a new entry in an iterator or to delete an entry. That however would not have any effect with the remote service unless you tell it. Yeah. So that's all locally. I can create a new iterator entry but then to persist that I would have to take that object that I created and pass it on to the exposed method on the data control. Here's a get request with parameters. Remember this hash hash name hash hash, which indicates a parameter. Here, if I drag and drop that method, it will ask me for 
uh, providing a value for the input argument, so department 10 for instance, I provide 10 and then the URI, URI that gets composed out of that would be departments slash 10 and then I would get just this single resource back. So this is how that gets exposed in the data control panel. The same with delete. You see that if I created a delete operation on a resource, then I use the HTTP method delete, but I don't want to have that showing in my data control panel necessarily. So I want to have a user-friendly or application coder-friendly name, so I can just call it remove department. And then I do have a post parameter that allows me to update. And again, this post parameter would take an input argument, an object, that I could take from an existing iterator. And here's where all of the internal infrastructures that we have in MAF make sense. Because if I call all departments, this all departments will have an iterator. And that will have a current row. If I want to delete that current row, I just call delete, so my remove department method, and pass a pointer to that current row to that method call which then on the client side will assemble the object into the uh, call to the REST service. You see it's pretty straightforward and simple. Once you have it set up, it's all declarative and visual development. So how do you manage REST connections? Well, similar to how you manage REST connections, uh, not REST connections, but SOAP connections, you have the ability to change the connection endpoint. And if you look in the application resources panel, which is one of the panels in JDeveloper that you see typically on the left hand side, and there's an equivalent option in Eclipse as well, you just click on that, double click on the entry, or just use the right mouse click and use properties, and that will then bring up the connectivity that you configured for that RESTful service. And then you can change the endpoint, uh, or if you uh, first started off with a service that doesn't require authentication, but now you're working on a service that requires authentication, then actually you can configure that. This concludes this episode about XML services and the talk. So I mentioned how you create uh, REST services based on an XML payload. I showed you the steps that are involved in that. I also mentioned that you can rerun that wizard so that you can change that information, add additional uh, resources and resource references. I showed you how to change the endpoint and I explained in full detail, full detail, I explained to you how the data control infrastructure looked like.